All right, so we're going to be doing the real world daily driver comparison here uh, for the review of the R7 1800X. So this is the top of the line Ryzen chip. It is going to be compared to my previous Intel computer. Uh, and like I say here, it is a daily driver comparison in the sense that I never got a review sample. I never got anything from AMD. I basically went out and purchased this computer or these parts rather from Micro Center on March 2nd, like everyone else, like a regular consumer, built the computer, went through all the caveats of building a computer, especially a new platform. We'll talk about that later. Um, but yeah, it's basically going to be comparing it to my previous Intel based computer. So this review focuses on those looking to upgrade from a three year or greater PC. So that could be anything built in 2014 or anything older than that. So things we'll be covering in this review there are Cinebench R15 benchmarks, Blender, Vegas 12, specifically main concept AVC MP4 rendering. So I think that's a good uh, rendering comparison here for CPUs. Uh, we'll also look at gaming because gaming, obviously, if you're buying a high-end system, you want to see how it plays games. Uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at MMOs, CPU limited tests rather than GPU limited tests. So I'll be showing my own testing with MMO tests, and these are the games that I actually play. Finally, we'll be looking at X264 because I am a Twitch live streamer for those that don't know. Um, so we'll be looking at how it handles XSplit OBS uh, rendering. So we have two systems that we'll be putting up against each other here. One is the AMD Ryzen test system. So as you can see, we're using the 1800X. Uh, at stock settings out of the box uh, and then the motherboard will be an msi uh, x370 x power gaming titanium this was the only motherboard in my area that i was able to get originally i did have the asus crosshair 6 but it was defective out of the box so i had to swap it for this one uh, we'll be testing it with uh, 16 gigs of patriot viper at 2666 so why i'm choosing 2666 as you can see with the cast latency timing of 15 because the performance index it comes out to about if you divide uh, 2666 by 15 you're going to get uh, 178 and that's going to be equal to if you look at the second system the intel test system is using a devil's canyon i7 4790k at stock so that's the cpu that uh, out of the box it's 4 gigahertz and it turbos up to 4.4 gigahertz so i actually have it set so that it will use 4.4 on all four cores all eight threads uh, and the motherboard is an MSI Z87 GD65 gaming so uh, people are probably wondering why I'm tr testing these two well that's because that's the other computer that I have and like I said originally this represents a review from somebody who is actually upgrading to Ryzen to see the benefits of the extra cores for production like I said I do video rendering I do uh, video game reviews I do a lot of twitch streaming so I need the extra horsepower, and we're going to see shortly how that actually comes into play. Um, SMT and for Intel, the hyperthreading is enabled, so 16 threads on Ryzen, 8 threads on the i7. So we can say that basically, in terms of if you wanted to pick up the uh, R1700 or the 1700X, you're not losing a whole lot in terms of the performance difference here. If you were to save money on getting one of those lower lower end SKUs, caveats of a bleeding edge platform. This happens to anyone who upgrades to a brand new platform where there is nothing uh, to base it off of previously, because this is Zen is a new micro architecture. It is nothing like uh, Bulldozer or any of the older AMD designs. It's basically the Intel XMP profile settings. The motherboard will try to set it to that. Um, but because it's the microcode is kind of buggy right now, uh, usually it will have to loosen the timings to run at that frequency. But so far, I haven't had too many issues with it. So just something to keep in mind for anyone thinking about running RAM higher than 2400 megahertz at, at this point in time. All right, so moving on to our first benchmark, we're looking at Cinebench R15 by Maxon. So as you can see, here's the results. So Ryzen 1800X stock at 3.6. On all cores, we're scoring, I'm seeing a score of around uh, 1579, so almost 1600, which is usually in the ballpark of what I saw a lot of reviewers getting. And also, this is tested in a actual case with the Noctua NHD14. The specific case is a Corsair 600T, so for the, from these results, it's clear that Ryzen shines best in multi-threaded workload. Both CPUs have an integer and floating point unit per each core, so... 
My best guess at this point is the differences in the way software uses different parts of the CPU, or it could just be a difference with the code path. Uh, and here it is in graphical representation, just to give you kind of a, a comparison here that shows that it is roughly about 50% scaling, a little bit less, but it's, it's still pretty close. Next, we'll move on to Blender. So this is for art and 3D modeling. So I used AMD's publicly available uh, test demo that they did, or they have it available. It's like, I forgot what the file name is. I'll put it in the description of the video below, but uh, basically you can see here that uh, these are pretty good results. It took it, it took the 1800X, mine at least, at stock 25 seconds, 25.45 seconds to render that image. It took my i7 CPU just over one minute, so 61.23 seconds. In this case, lower is better because you're looking at a time to completion difference. Moving on to video rendering for those that are using Vegas or Handbrake, anything that's going to use main concept based uh, video conversion or rendering of a uh, video file. In this case, I'm doing uh, MP4, AVC, 1080p, 30fps. So you can see again here, lower is better because we are looking at time in seconds. So it took for a for a, a 120 second video, so it's like roughly a two minute render. It took Ryzen 1800X uh, 70 seconds, so just over a minute, a minute and 10 seconds basically to render that file at 1080p 30fps using main concept. It took the i7 4790K just under two minutes, so that is quite a bit of time savings. You compound that with a higher frame rate, like if you were doing 1080p 60fps or 4K or higher resolution like 4K, uh, rendering then this time savings is dramatic next we're going to move on to gaming tests so for gaming what i did was i tested uh the heaven sword so that's final fantasy 14 the heaven sword benchmark it's a publicly available benchmark you can run it in dx11 or dx9 um, it's a pretty good benchmark for it's an mmo so it's cpu heavy it's also pretty gpu heavy so the way i tested it here uh, MMO games, by their very nature, are very CPU heavy and thus representative of a real-world CPU test. The benchmark uses DX11, and I tested in DX11 because that's the setting that I'm actually going to play the game at. We tested at 1080p borderless windowed mode. A lot of reviewers tested at full screen mode. Um, I'm testing at borderless windowed mode. I'm just kind of throwing a curveball out there to see how these CPUs handle that. And to eliminate the GPU from the equation, I'm running at that the low preset graphic settings, which are standard laptop settings. Uh, it goes from standard laptop to standard desktop to high performance to maximum settings. I'm, I'm using the lowest graphic settings, um, so the GPU is not the limiting factor. And again, the GPU used for this test was the Sapphire R9 Fury Nitro. And here is the score result. Uh, so you can see from the results, the Ryzen 1800X scored 17,473. Contrast that to the 4790K's 18,523. If you if you look at the frame rate over time, you get these results here. So roughly a six frames per second difference here, favoring the Intel um, i7-4790. So that's roughly similar performance to what you'd see with the Skylake 6700K my results are in line with what a lot of other reviewers have shown just for pure gaming ryzen does fall a little bit short but hey i mean 145 frames per second uh is no slouch at gaming like at that point it's already still saturating your 144 hertz monitor you're not you're not really going to notice what about live streaming so it's like this is something that amd showcased in the demo uh before ryzen was released I feel like this is something that we need to talk quite a bit about because this is a very interesting use case. Um, and we so for this test, what I did was we tested for non-partnered live streamers at the following settings in OBS or XSplit. Specifically, in this case, we used OBS. Uh, the stream output resolution is 1920 by 1080 at 30 FPS. That is a relevant resolution and frame rate for Twitch and YouTube gaming. Um, you can also do a downscale to 720p at 60 FPS or 720p at 30 FPS, which I actually believe is the best one for non uh, partners. 
So the max bitrate, as you'll see, is 2500 kilobits per second with constant bitrate enabled. That is because that is kind of a maximum supported setting that Twitch will allow a non-partner streamer to upload to their servers at. So you're pretty much capped at that. Um, the preset for X264, this is where it gets interesting. So this is the part where uh, the test, this is actually ha gonna have a really big impact on the performance difference here. So I'm using preset medium. A lot of people are probably wondering why I'm using medium because, well, as you can see, the max bit rate's not that great for 1080p. 2,500 kilobit per second on the default OBS preset of very fast, or I guess rather the X264 preset of very fast will look terrible. If you're live streaming an MMO or first person shooter or any of the other type of games, where especially if it's a third person game where you have a character that has their own animations plus the whole background and environment changing, transitioning through different scenes, the pixels are being redrawn. If you're running a very fast preset at less than 2000 kilobit per second, your stream will look terrible and no one will want to watch you. So for, to, in order to fix that problem without having to increase the bit rate, I will actually increase the compression, which means you run at a, a lower preset. So in this case, medium, because that's the best image quality per bitrate. So as you'd expect, the Ryzen R7 1800X completely dominates the Devil's Canyon 4790K. The results would be the same if you were to look at a 6700K or even the 7700K. Um, just the margin in difference would be lessened, but the Ryzen 8 core would still dominate every single time. It is worth mentioning that if you were to get a 1700 for $329, you could achieve similar results to what is shown here. I was live streaming uh, Final Fantasy XIV, an MMO. It's heavily CPU bound by nature of being an MMO. Plus, I'm using medium preset and I'm streaming at 1080p, 30 frames per second. This is the results you get. So if you want to look at the frame rate, the average FPS now is 137 frames per second on the Ryzen system and 123 frames per second on the Intel CPU. Now, what's interesting here, or what what this doesn't, what this graph doesn't actually capture, is the the perceivable visual that the the viewers of the stream would actually see. So I'm going to actually show that in a separate video. I want to see, I'll show you guys the difference because it's clear that the Intel, the quad core i7 is not actually capable of doing this. Like you can see it's running at 123 frames per second, but the stream has frame drops. It's choppy. So this does equalize, or this does actually duplicate what AMD was showing at their demo. So I actually believe that uh, it is pretty valid. So in my testing, the R7 1800X, 1700X, 1700 are all like really, really good CPUs for streaming. So, in conclusion, in the few days of testing the R7 1800X, it is clear that AMD has successfully managed to return to the high-end consumer CPU market. The Ryzen 7 CPU family is capable of high-performance computing for those that are involved with heavy computing workflows. It's also worth mentioning that it's no slouch when it comes to gaming. You saw there 144, 145 FPS for an MMO. That's pretty good. The 1700, 1700X, and 1800X are the go-to CPUs for non-partnered Twitch streamers or anyone looking to get their stream image quality up to the same level as partnered streamers without having to use a bitrate greater than 2,000 kilobits per second. I myself, personally, if you go and check my channel out, my Twitch channel, you go look at some of my past streams, the most recent ones I've done are using the 1800X. I am streaming at medium preset and I am streaming at a measly bit rate of 1500 kilobits per second. You go look at that image quality and you'll be shocked to see that, oh, 1500 kilobits per second on a 3D game looks this good? Wow. So it actually does, it's pretty easy for someone to watch my stream on a mobile device so I can actually hit as many people as I can to be able to watch my stream. Final recommendations. I recommend the R7 for live streamers, for video editors, artists, people who do 3D modeling work or animation or game development. It's also really good in Monte Carlo simulations with Excel. So it's really good in finance departments, IT sector. Um, it's just a really good number cruncher. And of course, I recommend it for gamers who want peace of mind that their CPU won't hold them back when running games plus multiple applications in the background. 
So I'll give you guys a little example here, a game. So we have a game plus Skype, plus Discord, plus Curse, plus OBS, plus a whole bunch of browser tabs open in Chrome or any sort of other memory hungry application. Um, you get the idea, the extra eight cores, all those extra threads will come in really handy for a multitasker. AMD missed the mark a bit though, I feel with its marketing to avid gamers, but in the long run, I feel the R7 lineup should age with grace as game developers streamline their code paths to take advantage of multi-threading. Instead, they should have focused more on strictly comparing Ryzen with the X99 lineup. So that would be CPUs like the i7 uh, 6800, the 6850K, and the 6900K. So final recommendations for me on Ryzen. For anyone on anyone out there on AMD FX or the old Phenom 2s, so those would be CPUs like the FX 4000, 6000, or the 8000 series, even the FX 9000 series, and including all the Athlons and older, this is your upgrade path. Basically, go out and upgrade to Ryzen as soon as you got the money for it because it is worth the money for anybody on an old AMD system. For anyone on Sandy Bridge or Ivy Bridge, so those would be chipsets like uh, the Z68, Z77, Ryzen is a great upgrade because you're getting a much newer platform. So for anyone on X58, so that would be uh, the Nehalem i7s like the i7-920, the Gulf Town 980X, those are like the six core, those are like the first six core consumer chips from Intel back in like 2010, 2009. So these are pretty old, like six, seven years old now, these systems. Uh, Ryzen is also a great upgrade because your IPC is gonna be way better over those. You got more th cores, more threads, if you're getting the R7s. I just go on and on. It's just basically you're getting a better platform. Uh, it's a platform upgrade that will mature better over time with all the BIOS updates, so yeah. And then for anyone on Haswell base, Z87, Z97, people like me, because I, I had a Z87 Haswell system, Ryzen is a good upgrade. So anyone go coming from an i5, like a fourth gen or older i5 or i7, um, Ryzen is a defin definite good upgrade because, again, you're getting a lot for the money. You're getting a much better motherboard with a bunch of features that you didn't have previously and so for anyone on x79 what about people on like sandy bridge e or ivy bridge e cpus that were new in like 2012 2013 uh ryzen is worth considering i would say it's worth considering but there are trade-offs x79 if you go off of x79 you're trading away your quad channel and your extra pcie lanes for improved ipc and power consumption so those cpus are like 130 watt 140 watt tdp Ryzen's like 95 watt TDP. It has better IPC than the old Sandy Bridge E. Uh, and of course, you're getting like PCIe 3.0, you're getting M.2, U.2, etc., etc. You're getting all these new like platform upgrades. So it's still worth considering for those people. Uh, for anyone else, anyone on the old Core 2, Phenoms, Nehalems, all those original old quad cores and dual cores, anything older. Ryzen 7 is an outstanding upgrade because you will find you'll it's like night and day coming off of like a, a Q6600. So yeah, definitely if you are on the fence, I wholly recommend getting Ryzen or going going from your Core 2 quad or from Nehalem to Ryzen. It, it's like a really good deal. And congratulations because you guys probably have about 10 year old systems, so you only upgraded like once in a decade this is a pretty good upgrade i would say so yeah anyone with anything older than z170 i would say anyone who's on like a ddr3 based memory system ryzen's pretty good worth considering all the way up to a great upgrade so that's basically all i had to say guys uh thanks for viewing uh, leave a comment what you guys think in terms of feedback if you're going to go with a ryzen system if you have any questions you can let me know and i'll catch you guys the next time thanks